Um, so why don't we go ahead and start? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Microstructure Exchange. Um, this is going to be the last one of the season. Um, so let's, you know, let's have a good time with it. Um, today we have uh, Jean Edouard Colliard uh, from HEC Paris, which and he, um, he's presenting algorithmic pricing and liquidity in securities markets, which is joint work with uh, Thierry and Stefano. Um, so uh, Jean Edouard said he's he's happy to be interrupted. So for you know for the first forty five minutes of the talk, you can kind of like follow your questions in. If it starts getting slow, I might kind of like put a pause on questions and defer them to like little batches or to the la the last fifteen minutes, which is going to be an open Q and A. Um, John Edward is also happy to stick around for a little bit after the top of the hour, um, you know, in case people have uh, extra questions. Um, and I believe uh, Thierry and Stefano are here as well, so they you know they may also just kind of like bump into the chat. Um, and then Andreas put a link in here um, about our call for papers for the next season. So if you want to be, if you want to present at Microstructure Exchange, um, uh, you can go to the link that's in the chat or the one that's on the top of the website. Um, and the submission deadline is July twentieth. If you want to be, um, if you want consideration for for a presentation. Okay, I think that's all I had. Um, John Edward, uh, why don't you take it away? Thank you, thank you, Cameron, for the for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, everybody for for attending. It's, it's great to present this paper here. Thanks for the organizers for you know inviting this paper and for organizing the, the microstructure exchange in general. It's absolutely uh, a great pleasure to have this in in our field. Okay, so the paper I'm going to present is joint work with uh, Thierry and Stefano, who are in uh, the audience and are going to take the the tough questions. You know, as uh, should be uh, as is generally the rule. Uh, before starting. Let me just mention, you know, Management Science is uh, editing a special issue on the human algorithm connection. So I will be the, the finance editor for that special issue. I think there are many topics that are interesting for people in microstructure. The deadline is 9 September 2022. So have a look at the Management Science website and uh, send us your best papers, obviously. Okay. All right. So without further ado, uh, let me talk about the topic of today, which is uh, algorithms in uh, securities markets. Okay, just a bit of uh, motivation. So, well, you know, this is a microstructure crowd. So we all know that most of the trading today in stock markets in particular is algorithmic or even high frequency. And so, you know, this is now a very, very important feature of uh, financial markets. Okay, so here this is with European data, but obviously this is the same, you know, pretty much everywhere. And I guess we all know, you know, this uh, paper in JFE by, by Maureen O'Hara, which is very insightful and, and she makes the point that you know trading has changed, and and probably you know the, the fact that now algorithms are so prevalent in, in financial markets calls you know for new tools and and things you know to really take into account the fact that nowadays uh, markets are algorithmic. Okay, and so what we do in this paper, we try to offer a kind of framework to really you know uh, uh, tackle this this issue and answer you know the the call of uh, of Maureen. Basically, that's uh, that's a bit the idea. Let me also give you some further evidence of things that are, you know, show that maybe uh, things are a bit puzzling and, and we need new tools, you know, to understand conceptually what's going on in, in algorithmic markets. So this is um, a figure in the in the JFQA paper by, by, by Brogard and Garriott. And so what this show, what they show in this paper is that when you have more high frequency traders entering the market, you know, what you don't have, you don't really have price competition. So instead you see that when you have, you know, two High frequency uh, market makers, they don't compete until the spreads reach zero. And what you need is many high frequency traders uh, to enter. And they point out that this looks more like com quantity competition rather than price competition, even though, you know, in principle, we tend to think, to think of, of limit order markets as having uh, price competition. Okay. And so maybe this means that there is something strange going on. And maybe this is due to the fact that these market makers are. Uh, algorithmic. And finally, in the industrial organization literature, there is a growing interest for the role of uh, algorithms, so both from the academics and from competition authorities. And so in particular, more and more people are concerned that uh, maybe when you have, you know, pricing algorithms, setting the prices for, you know, airline tickets or books on Amazon or whatever, uh, they might, you know, collude and reach supra-competitive prices, even if you have uh, many algorithms that compete on the market, and actually there is evidence that there is some tacit collusion going on. For instance, on the on the gasoline market, this is a nice paper by Brown and McKay. Um, and so there is a lot of concern in in IO, and you would think, well, you know, in finance we have 
many more algorithms. We are in environments that are much more challenging. And so if anything, we should be uh, even more concerned. And so there's, there's uh, I think, a good motivation for thinking more about the role of algorithms in finance. And, and you know, uh, as, you, as you may have noticed, we are three theorists in this paper. So in particular, we believe that it's important to have some theories that take into account the fact that players nowadays are algorithmic. Okay, so that's uh, the motivation. A final piece of evidence is, is brought to me by uh, XKCD that weird things can happen on markets. This is a cartoon I just uh, I just found. Okay, very good. So uh, given all this, so what is um, the research question? So the research question is very simple. It's do algorithms matter in securities markets? Okay, basically, you know, the idea is if we have algorithms who interact with each other instead of humans, is it going to be the exact same outcome as before, maybe just, you know, it's a bit faster, or maybe even it will look even more like the predictions of standard uh, game theory models, or are we going to have something uh, fundamentally different? Okay, so I think this is pretty much an open question. I mean, from a, you know, theory perspective, ex ante, you could, you could, you could completely argue in, in both um, directions. And so more precisely, we want to know how does algorithmic pricing change the, the trading process? Do algorithms uh, behave differently from what is predicted by standard models? And you know, if they do, can this explain maybe some puzzling patterns in the data? So for instance, price cycles have been documented, maybe flickering quotes, mini flash crashes, and so on, okay? So I don't want to oversell the paper. I'm not going to explain any of this in this particular paper, but the point is to say, you know, if we, if we go in this line of thinking, maybe there is a research agenda ahead of us, which is to uh, try to have new kinds of theories taking into account we have algorithms on markets, and you know maybe those theories would have the potential to explain some you know recent phenomena in markets that we have uh, that we have not fully understood yet. Okay, so that's the research question. All right, so. That's a nice research question, but it's pretty vague. So what are we going to do um, exactly? So if you remember this quote by, by Maureen O'Hara, she pointed out in particular that you know, we need to reconsider the way we model uh, learning in financial markets. What we are going to do is to consider a very standard learning model, which is going to be a kind of Gloston Milgram environment. Okay, So we tend to think of this paper as a kind of proof of concept or a workhorse model, if you want, for this issue of algorithms. So we start with something uh, very simple. And so what we do in this Glosson and Milgram environment is that instead of having, uh, instead of modeling rational participants who would perhaps be very sophisticated humans and who are going to play the base nash equilibrium, we are going to, um, to have experiments in which you have reinforcement learning algorithms that play against each other. Okay, and so we let them play for a very long time. We do that many, many times, and we look at what is the outcome, and 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 we and we study whether this outcome, in terms of prices, in terms of volumes, uh, instead of other observables, is close to the predictions of standard theory, or is it different? And can we understand uh, why it is different? We are interested, in particular, in the deviations between the outcome of this experiment and the prediction of a standard model. Okay, as I said before. I don't want to oversell what we do in this paper. So for today, it's really more like a kind of proof of concept model, which, what we have done so far. And so in particular, we are going to show that, well, as you can imagine, otherwise I would not be here. Uh, when you uh, run these experiments, you reach outcomes that can be substantially different from the predictions of standard models. And in a way that we think is, is interesting and relevant, okay? This being said, you will see that the model I'm going to, to show the environment is very, very simple, okay? So it's not particularly realistic or anything. So it's really a first step. And we think, you know, it's, it's just a kind of call for doing more in this, uh, in this research program, okay? So the, the next steps in this program would be to have a more realistic setup, to check whether these deviations exist in real data and so on and so on, but there is none of this for today, okay? Good, all right. Again, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have, if you have any, any question or, or comment. Okay, let me preview a little bit the, the results and, you know, keeping in mind again that, you know, this is a very simplistic model, so it's not clear to what extent we would expect these results to be, to be confirmed in the data, but the point is rather to show that even in this simple model, there are already interesting things that can happen, okay? So what we see is that if we have a, a single algorithm, so a kind of monopolistic market maker in this Gloston Milgram environment, uh, this algorithm doesn't always learn the monopoly price. And actually, 
on average, there is a structure, so this algorithm charges lower prices than the monopoly, okay? Uh, instead, when you have multiple algorithmic dealers, well, they don't always learn the competitive price. Actually, there's a lot of dispersion in the outcome that you can observe. And on average, they charge higher prices than the competitive price. So it's the opposite, if you will, okay? Uh, actually, what we find in general is that the behavior of, of algorithmic dealers that compete with each other, it's kind of somewhere between the monopoly case and the competitive case. So it's a bit reminiscent of this view in, in, uh, in Brogard and Garriott that actually it's more like quantity competition than price competition, it's somewhere between monopoly and, uh, and Bertrand. Uh, we also show that algorithmic dealers, they are able to learn not to be adversely selective. Okay, so very simple, the very simple algorithms we use, they are not fooled by uh, the winner's curse, so to speak. So they, they learn that pretty easily, actually. Uh, and even more uh, surprising to us, adverse selection seems to facilitate the learning of the competitive price. So when, to be completely honest, when we started this, we thought, oh, you know, these algorithms, maybe they work in the simple environments that people consider in IO, but once we put this in a more challenging finance environment with adverse selection, they are going to reach all kinds of crazy outcomes. And it's not really what happens. So if anything, it's the opposite. It seems that the algorithms, you know, the competition between algorithms uh, leads to an outcome which is more in line with the theory when you have more adverse selection. Okay, I will try to explain to you uh, why this is the case. And that's quite interesting because this may mean that actually if you are concerned about um, algorithmic interaction leading to non-competitive behavior, well, maybe actually you need to, to look for, you know, markets in which adverse selection is relatively uh, low rather than, than the opposite. And you think this is potentially an interesting insight, okay, to the extent that you believe in the model, which again is fairly uh, simplistic. Finally, we have a multi-paired extension in which we also uh, allow dealers to learn the value of the asset over time, like in the original uh, Gloston Milgram model. And we show that to some extent, the algorithms actually do learn over time. So they are able to perform uh, price discovery, if you want. Uh, but again, there are some like anomalies and quirks that we, that we document. Okay. These are the main findings. So as you can already see, this is going to be very tough to talk about everything in one hour, but uh, I will do my best. Okay, um, all right. Just in terms of literature, very quickly. So in economics, there is, uh, most of you are probably not aware of this, but there is a very interesting, very recent and, and growing literature on algorithmic pricing and in particular on the possibility of tacit collusion uh, when you have multiple algorithms interacting with each other. Uh, the main one in this literature is a paper by, by Calvano et al in the American Economic Review. And, and we, we, the experiments we perform are relatively close in spirit to what they do, but the environment is completely different. In particular, uh, as we will show, you know, the presence of adverse selection is something that, that really changes this type of, of, um, of game. Okay, so that's one thing. And obviously, and you are probably all aware of, of this literature, uh, probably much more than myself, actually, there is, of course, you know, an entire literature on high-frequency trading. In particular, there are some recent papers uh, on, on HFT and competition, and we think that, you know, perhaps this, this first uh, paper is, is kind of interesting for this debate on, you know, uh, why, why does it look like uh, HFT market makers, in particular, don't reach a very competitive uh, behavior, okay? All right, all good so far? Yeah, yes, okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to first explain to you the benchmark model we are using. And so that's going to be a bit painful because it's a kind of modified Gloston Milgram uh, setup. So this is just, uh, you know, this is a microeconomic model basically, but we need this to have, you know, a benchmark where we know what we would expect rational players uh, to do in, in the environment we consider. Then I'm going to explain to you how we uh, design algorithms to play the same game. And then I'm going to show you well the, the outcomes from simulations and, and what are really the results of the model. Okay, so what is this benchmark model? So again, you know, we want to have a kind of proof of concept model to, to just show that it's interesting to, to consider this kind of environment. So we start very simple. We take a one period Gloston Milgram model. Okay, so I guess everybody is familiar with the Gloston Milgram model. I hope that this is the case. Uh, and just we modify it a little bit. We take a version where the, the demand is uh, elastic. 
Okay, and so that's a little bit different from what you may be uh, used to. So the details are the following. So we have one risky asset. Okay, it has a payoff V tilde, and V tilde can take two values. It's either VH or VF. Okay, think of this as you know, uh, it's the expected value plus something, or the expected min value minus something with probability one half, one half. Okay, we can do more general things, but you know that's basically the idea. We have n dealers. Okay, it's Gloston Milgram, so think of them as dealers. Simultaneously quoting ask prices. We only consider the ask side, not the bid side, but that would be symmetric. And so the ask prices uh, are quoted before knowing V tilde, okay, so that there is adverse selection. Then a single trader arrives, he has a valuation for the asset, and so this valuation is V tilde, so you know the trader knows V tilde, and he also has a private liquidity shock or a private valuation for the asset L tilde, where L tilde follows some continuous distribution G. Okay, so I arrive, I'm a trader, I see all the ask prices on the market. I know the actual valuation of the asset. I have on top of this, my shock, which gives me a private valuation. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the uh, lowest ask price. If the lowest ask price is lower than my valuation, then I trade with this dealer. Otherwise I just don't trade, okay? If a trade occurs, then the dealer with the best quote, or if there are multiple dealers, uh, we assume that they split uh, the trade, the dealer with the best quote earns the ask price minus V tilde. Okay, and then V tilde is realized and the dealer might lose money in particular if, he, uh, if he's a victim of adverse selection. Okay, so that's a very standard uh, setup, except maybe for this kind of elastic uh, demand, which we don't see in all uh, variants of this model. So when you try to solve the model, it's, it's relatively simple actually. So you need to compute the likelihood that a client buys. Okay, so that's the demand that you face at a given price. So if um, the lowest ask price is A min and the actual value of V tilde is, is V tilde, then the demand is the probability that the trade occurs. So that's the probability that the client wants to, um, wants to trade and it's just given by one minus G of A min minus V tilde. Okay, so we can compute uh, the demand. The demand decreases with the price. Okay, that's intuitive. Um, uh, sorry, the demand, okay, that's not intuitive actually. Um, yeah, this decreases with the ask price and increases with the value uh, V tilde. Okay, if you have end dealers uh, who post uh, the best quote, we can write the dealer's profit like this okay so that's very simple basically if you have the best price you get the full demand and you earn your price minus v tilde if there are multiple dealers that cause the, the that quote the best price we assume you share uh, the demand if you don't quote the best price then you have a profit of zero okay right and so unsurprisingly what happens in this setup is that there is adverse selection okay so if you are a dealer and you quote the best price, you expect to, uh, to have more demand when the asset value is VH than when the, the asset value is VL, okay? Why? Because you face <coughs> people who want to buy the asset from you. And so obviously when the asset value is high, you will have more buyers than when the asset value is low, okay? You can compute the expected profit at a given price A, okay? So this is this quantity pi bar, pi bar of A, and you can write it uh, like this, okay? So you can write it as the expected value of the demand at my price times A minus the expected value of the asset, okay? So that's basically the, the average profit you would have without adverse selection minus the covariance between the demand you face and V tilde, okay? And there is adverse selection because this covariance is positive. You face more demand when the asset value is high than when the asset value is low, okay? So for the moment, it's like microstructure 101 uh, stuff, okay? Good, but that's very fundamental. And in particular, this is something that is completely absent from this literature looking at algorithms uh, in IO, okay? All right, so that's the setup. Once we have this set up, the question is, well, okay, how is the price going to be determined? So there are two uh, natural benchmarks. So one of them is the monopoly price, okay? So you could just compute the price AM that maximizes my pi bar of A here, 
Okay, it's not a completely easy computation, but uh, you can uh, you can compute this. And so, standard theory would predict that if you have a single uh, dealer or a single market maker, the ask price would correspond to this uh, AM to this monopoly price. Okay, and so uh, that's that's what is done in, for instance, Gloucester '89 or Lynch and Madavan '95. Another benchmark is, of course, the Gloucester and Milgram uh, benchmark. So that's the competitive price. It's the price AC such that the expected profit is zero. Okay, and so standard theory would predict that if you have more than two uh, market makers or more than two dealers, there is Bertrand competition, and basically the price that you will uh, obtain will be equal to this competitive price. Okay, so these are our two benchmarks. And so in particular, we will try to have our algorithms uh, play this game and see whether uh, they reach something close to the monopoly price, close to the competitive price, something in between or outside or whatever. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end. And so just to give you a little bit, uh, an idea of, of what's going to, to happen uh, later on. So in the, the standard parameterization we are going to use in our uh, algorithmic experiments, we will have VH equal 4, VH equal 0, P equal 0 0.5. Okay, so the asset is worth either 4 or 0 with equal probabilities. And the, the, the liquidity shock L, okay, so remember that's this uh, part here. This is uh, Gaussian with an, um, an expectation of 0 and a standard deviation of 5. Okay, so the standard deviation is actually quite large relative to the value of the asset. So sometimes, you know, even if the value for the asset is low, you have a high chance of facing someone who wants to buy uh, this asset. Okay, and if you look at the theoretical uh, prediction, so for instance, you know, it's just one prediction, but that's the one which will be the most interesting afterwards. Actually, when you increase the standard deviation, okay, so when you have when you face so when you increase the standard deviation of the demand for the asset. What happens is that, in a sense, there is less and less adverse selection, okay? Because you, you become more and more likely to face a strong demand, even if the value for the asset is uh, low, okay? And uh, what happens in that case is that in the competitive case, the competitive, uh, sorry, the competitive price decreases in sigma. Why? Because as I increase sigma, there is less and less adverse selection, so I can lower the price without making losses. Okay, so that's one effect. If you look at the monopoly price, interestingly, it's the opposite. So when, uh, for the monopoly price, when you increase sigma, what happens is that the monopolist is facing a demand which is less and less elastic. And so if the demand is less elastic, then you can quote a higher price and still you know, uh, face a positive demand. So you are optimally choosing a higher price. Okay, so the competition case and the monopoly case give very different predictions regarding the impact uh, of sigma because you have these two effects and so in particular we are going to increase sigma in our simulations and see whether you know the outcome will be closer to what happens in the competitive case or closer to what happens in the monopoly case okay there are other comparative statics exercises but that's the, the best one i think cameron i think you have a question but i don't hear you Come on, I, I can't hear you. So. Just, uh, I don't know, can, can other people hear me? Or is it just- yeah, No, it's okay. Uh, okay, gotcha. Okay, so are these symmetric prices? These are these are symmetric bid and ask prices in the in the competitive case or in the like the actual like Gloss and Milgram case, right? No, uh, okay, uh, good question. So we, we just consider a market in which uh, you only put an ask price. Okay. Oh, okay. But gotcha. of course, because because of the way we set up the um, the shock here, it's possible that you face someone who actually you know has a very negative L, and this person would like to sell, but we just don't allow the market makers to quote a bid price. Okay, we just look at one okay. side of the book. So then, if this happens, just you know nothing happens. There is nothing. Else. Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you. In the in the theory, it would be super easy to extend to the bid price as well. In the algo case, it's a, you have to think a little bit more so to simplify. Maybe. Okay, uh, we have a hand from um, uh, Jose Penalva. Um, Jose, do you, do, you, do you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you. So I, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Jose. Yes. Um, so my my question is regarded the the price grid. So we have a, a paper that does some algorithmic uh, 
uh, we actually characterize the algorithm's behavior using ordinary differential equations so we can characterize the dynamics. And we find that the dynamics are very strongly driven by the discreteness of the price grid. So I wanted to know what kind of price grid you're using. Very good. I encourage everybody to read your paper, actually, because it's pretty good. Um, OK, so that's a good question. So, so far, I've only talked about the theory. So what I have shown you here is just assuming that prices are continuous. Uh, then we can also solve numerically what would happen in theory with just a discrete grid. And when we use our algorithms, we have a discrete price grid, okay? Because we are going to use Q-learning algorithms. And so, you know, they use a discrete uh, set of, of actions. Uh, and we can vary the tick size, actually. But in everything we do, the, the tick is actually pretty, pretty big, okay? And so that, that, may, that may matter. Okay, but you will see the results when I mention them, and, and if you have, uh, and, and feel free to reinterrupt me at that time. Thank you. Okay. But obviously, it matters. Okay. I don't see other hands, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, okay. So, so far, this was just you know what would happen according to the the standard uh, theory we are we are used to. Okay. So the next step is what would happen with algorithmic dealer. And so I just would like to, to pause here and say, you know, but why, why would we need algorithms in the first place? So if you think about the dealers in Gloucester Midrum, actually they have a lot of things to learn about, okay? And so again, you know, I'm adding on this theme of that learning is important in, in Maureen O'Hara's uh, paper. So they have to learn about the environment, which means they have to learn what is this profit function pi, okay? So they need to learn how much profit they can expect from each price that they can choose. They need to learn about the tilde, okay? And they also need to learn about the behavior of the other dealers, okay? These are three different dimensions. And in standard theory, so what we assume is that everybody knows pi, so everybody knows the environment. Um, in, you learn the tilde because you are Bayesian, and you know the behavior of others because you assume they play the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so these are very good assumptions that you know we love as theories, so I have no problem with them. But it's important to realize that these are you know pretty strong assumptions basically, and uh, there is a whole literature, for instance, in evolutionary game theory or the theory of learning in games that tries you know to see whether some learning processes can lead you know to uh, agents to to learn both things uh, endogenously. So our approach here will be to use reinforcement learning algorithms. We'll assume they have zero prior knowledge about the environment. Okay, so they just know the prices they can play, but that's all. So they don't know pi, they don't know v, they don't know what the others are playing, they know nothing. Okay, so they are completely ignorant about this model, and they are just going to play, you know, a large number of times, and we're going to see whether they converge to uh, to something interesting or whether they converge at all, actually. Okay. All right. So to give you an idea of how this is going to work, so we are going to use Q-learning algorithms. And so I'm going to, to explain this very, very briefly, but believe me, this is actually super simple, okay? So people who work in computer science or machine learning, they would have you believe that this is super complicated and you need to follow extremely long programs to do these kind of things. This is not the case at all. So coding this kind of stuff, you know, takes one hour at most, you know, in a simple environment. And so I encourage everybody to, you know, uh, get their hands dirty a bit and, and, and try those things because they are, they are quite fun and the, the fixed cost of investing in this is actually not, uh, not that large, okay? So consider the case of a single dealer to simplify, okay? Uh, so, you know, one possibility would be, you could say, well, if I know nothing, I could try all the values of all the possible ask prices many, many times until I reach some kind of estimate for the profit function. And then I pick, you know, the value that seems to be optimal. So if you do that in the long run, that's going to work, okay? Without even any knowledge of the environment, if you just try randomly for many, many times, you are going to get a pretty good estimate and then you pick what seems to be the optimal behavior. So in the long run, you probably have the, the you probably find the, the actual monopoly price. The problem is that the short run, you play suboptimal prices many times, okay? And so this behavior is known in the literature as Exploration, basically exploring means you try random things many times in order to better understand the environment you are facing, okay? Like an explorer. The, another type of behavior would be to try uh, each uh, price only a few times and try to quickly get a sense of what seems to be uh, an appropriate price and what seems to be not such a good price. And so you discard prices that lead to low profits uh, pretty quickly. Okay, after a few periods, 
you start playing only the prices that seem to give uh, good results and you forget about the prices that led to bad results in the, in the past. And so what's going to happen in that case is that in the short run, you quickly arrive at payoffs that are better than random. But in the long run, there is a significant chance that actually you are going to play forever a price which is not the monopoly price and so a price which is suboptimal. Okay? And this type of behavior is known in the literature as exploitation. And so as probably many of you know, there is a trade-off between the two. Okay? You can choose to explore more. In the long run, that's good. You are more likely to find the monopoly price, but there is a cost in the short run. If you care more about the short run, you want to exploit more quickly the information you have learned by exploring uh, before. And so the idea of Q-learning algorithms is that they give you a particular rule to alternate between uh, exploring and exploiting, and you can also parameterize how much you want to do uh, of both. Okay. And so how does the algorithm work? Well, it, it's relatively simple. So imagine that you play the game uh, big T times. Okay. So each time we play, we call this an episode. Okay. Importantly, it's still the one period Gloston Milgram game. Okay. So all these episodes are independent of each other. There is no, no learning of V tilde across episodes or things like that. Okay. We just repeat a one period game many times. We start with a random matrix that we are going to call uh, Q0. And so Q0 associates to each possible price A a certain value. Okay. And then in every episode, with some probability epsilon t equal to exponential of minus beta t, so it's decreasing over time, we explore. And when we explore, we play a random price a t. Okay. So imagine it's uniform, so you play all prices with equal probabilities. Otherwise, so with probability one minus exponential minus beta t, you exploit, which means you look at your matrix uh, Q, which is now QT. You have you update it in uh, in each period, and um, you look at your matrix and you take the price which is associated with the highest value in this matrix. Okay, imagine you do that. So you you pick a certain price. This becomes your new price AT. You play AT, and then once you play AT, the trader arrives, observes her uh, private valuation, chooses to trade with you or not, and you get a payoff, okay? You denote this payoff pi t, this is your payoff in period t. Once you have your payoff, you update the cell of your Q matrix, which is associated with a t. So you say, well, you know, I played, I just played a t, the new value associated to a t in my Q matrix is alpha times pi t plus one minus alpha times the previous value. So in each period, I update the value of the Q matrix associated with the price I just played. And so I update it to uh, a weighted average of the payoff I just got and the value I had before in my Q matrix. Okay. So just to give you a better intuition, here is an example. Okay. So it's a very simple example. Imagine there are only two prices. You can play a price of three or a price of four. And so your Q matrix, you start with zero, zero. Okay. The first line is the value associated to the price three. The second line is the value associated with the price four. Okay, at the beginning, you know nothing about the environment, so just assume both lead to a profit of zero. Okay, and I pick alpha equal to 0 0.5, so this is how you are going to update. In t equal one, I will explore with probability 0 0.9, and otherwise I will exploit. Okay, you take a random draw, imagine we explore. Okay, explore. I can either play three or play four. Equally likely, imagine we pick three. Okay, I play three. Then the trader arrives, chooses to trade with me or not. Imagine the trade occurs, and the value is actually the low value of the asset. Okay, I'm going to observe my payoff, and so this payoff is very simple. It's just the price. Um, it's just sorry. I'm sorry. There is a typo here. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to update this number. The price is three, okay? And so the new value in my Q matrix will be alpha times three minus VL, sorry, there is a typo, plus one minus alpha times the value I had before, which was zero. So the new value will be 1.5 and not two as I wrote here, okay? So you update your Q matrix with a 1.5, which corresponds to what you just played, okay? So now I have my new Q matrix Q1. I have a 1.5 that corresponds to price three. Okay. I move to period two. Again, I explore with some probability, which is now 0 0.82, okay, because the probability to explore 
decreases over time. Again, I choose to explore. This time I play four. Once again, there is a trade, the value was low. I update now the second cell, which corresponds to price four, alpha times four minus VL. And this time I got two. I'm sorry, I just inverted these two things. And so this time I get two. New Q matrix now, Q2 equal 1.5, two. And I continue like this. Imagine that this time there is a trade, but the value now is VH, it's equal to four. So now my profit is actually zero because I'm selling at the price of four, something which was worth four. Okay, so I decrease my profit here and I update again and so on and so on. Okay, so I'm going to update in each period. Here, period four, I'm going to choose to exploit this time. When I exploit, I look at the best, uh, what looks like the best price. Here I see that the payoff associated with three is higher than the payoff associated with four. So I choose to play three. Again, there is a trade. Here, uh, the value VH, you know, bad luck was four. So I sell at three, something which is worth four. I make a lot of a loss of minus one. I update my Q matrix again. Now the new value in the Q matrix will be 0 0.25 and so on and so on. Okay, and I do that for maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of periods. Okay, that's how the algorithm works. As you can see, there is nothing terribly complicated about it. Okay, so it's just uh, trying different things and updating this, uh, this Q matrix. Okay, so the intuition is the following. After each round, the algorithm is going to learn about the performance of different actions. You give more and more weight to actions that have been more profitable in the past. As time passes, you explore less and less and you exploit more and more. The speed at which you decrease this exploration is governed by beta. Okay, when you increase beta, you, uh, you, for, you, you decrease your exploration more quickly. And alpha governs how, how much weight you put on the most recent uh, observations. Here again, there is a trade-off. What what's important is that, you know, the basic assumptions in all this is that we have no idea of what is the environment. So in principle, we cannot at all optimize alpha and beta. Okay, those are parameters. We don't have any theory of where alpha and beta should be set, we just have like standard practices in the literature, but they are not based on, on any uh, theory. Uh, so, so we have a hand from, that, from Pete. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, why isn't the default assumption alpha equals one over t? Why is why would you ever use a half? Seems so, like so you would, why is so, the default assumption alpha equals, why isn't it alpha equals one over t? So it seems like after you've played many times, you would, mm -hmm. um, you would have a, use a lower alpha because you're, you've got a, a stronger prior on <clears throat> what you already have. Ah, okay. Yes, uh, very good. So here we use a constant alpha, which is kind of standard in a lot of the literature, in particular in this econ literature I was mentioning before. There are many other ways to parameterize all those things, right? So you could choose a different rule for uh, epsilon t rather than an exponential decay like this. Instead of having this constant weight uh, alpha, you could have a weight that decreases over time, or you could have more complicated functions uh, as well. Again, there is no particular reason for doing this or, or something else, because there is not much sense in which you can optimize this, right? Because optimizing would require you to have a prior over the possible environments you can, you can face. So we just take this because it's relatively standard and simple, but, uh, but sure, you can find many variants on that. But the constant alpha kind of assumes you're not learning. Seems like uh, alpha equals one over t would at least uh, be consistent with calling it reinforcement learning rather than reinforcement randomness. <laughs> okay, I see. So what we are going to do is that we are going to use because of this type of issue, right, quite low values of of alpha. Uh, but uh, no, but you're right. I mean, it it, it makes sense to um, to decrease the uh, to decrease the alpha over time. I think one reason it's done like this in the literature is that people worry about um, the fact that the environment may be changing, that uh, if you decrease alpha over time, if the environment changes, you are not going to be able to, um, to, uh, to update what you are doing because you, you are giving very, very little weight to, uh, to past observations. Okay? And so our environment is going to be stationary, but when you have competitive players, you know, algorithms that interact with each other, it's not really stationary, and so it, it would make a big difference. We could try actually what happens when, when alpha t decreases over time. But for instance, I'm not sure it would give 
I'm not sure you would have an incentive necessarily to, to have alpha decrease a lot over time when you have multiple uh, efforts. That's something we can look at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I also see a hand from Peter, but Peter, could you like kick it to wait like five minutes until we get to the Q&A? Okay, thank you, Peter. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so then we just uh, we just implement this. So we run uh, 10,000 experiments. In each experiment, we have 200,000 episodes. Okay, so each time our algorithms are going to learn for 200,000 episodes. And then we do that 10,000 times and we take averages over those things. Okay, so we get a sense of the average price to which algorithms are going to converge and, and the rest is just really uh, parameterization. Okay, so for instance, with the monopolist, this is what you obtain. So this is how the, the quoted spread. So the quoted spread is basically the, the quoted price minus, minus two. This is how it evolves over time. Okay, so you can see that actually you start with a very high uh, price and then you learn to decrease your price uh, gradually, okay, until you reach something uh, like four here. And interestingly, you know, it looks like you are converging, but actually this is very variable across experiments okay so there are experiments in which you converge to six experiments in which you converge to seven to eight to nine or to five depending on the draws you've had and so what's interesting is that even though we allow for quite a lot of experimentation and, and learning uh, you are quite easily <coughs> led to, um, to to select a suboptimal price actually the optimal monopoly price would be seven and our algorithm uh, picks uh, six, okay? So that's quite uh, most of the time. So what we see is that uh, actually the algorithm picks a price which is lower than the monopoly price. And that's something which is quite, uh, it seems to be quite general. So if we change the parameterization, you know, we have tried a lot of things and this seems to be relatively uh, general. Uh, we try to prove more or less analytically that, that this has to be uh, the case in this environment, but this is still, uh, work in progress. The point I want to make is that at least in these experiments, the fact that we have Q-learning algorithms doesn't introduce any bias towards higher prices. If anything, it's the opposite. Okay? It tends to generate prices that are lower uh, than what is predicted by the, by the theory. So let me go to the more interesting part of the paper, which is what happens when now you have competing algorithms. Okay, So instead of having only one algorithm learning to set prices, I have several algorithmic dealers who set uh, prices at the same time, okay? All right. And so I can do again the same type of, of experiment. So here you see over time, so what's happening is that, you know, there is this kind of strange nonlinear uh, dynamic, which is that at the beginning, they lower their prices, you know, so this is the case with two uh, algorithms competing with each other. At the beginning, they lower their prices and then they increase them again and they seem to converge to something um, on average. Okay, if you look at the distribution, so this is the distribution at the end for the two players, and you can see that again, there is quite a bit of variation. The two players are symmetric. So these two graphs, are, these two histograms are the same, which is normal. Uh, you see that actually quite often they play uh, five, uh, but they also can also play six, seven, four, eight, and so on. So there is a lot of dispersion. And it's quite it's significantly different from the Nash equilibrium price because the Nash equilibrium price would be three. Okay, so they play something which is much above uh, the Nash equilibrium price. We can also, um, we can, and so here, uh, what I, I show you is different measures. So this is the quoted spread. This is the trading volume. This is the effective spread, the realized spread and the price impact. Okay, we can compute all of this in this nice uh, Lawson Milgram setup. And so here I show you the average value that we have in, the, in our experiments. Okay, with a, with a duopoly uh, of algorithms. Here you have the theory uh, of the, sorry, the, the theoretical prediction in the competitive case. Okay, uh, in the competitive case, you have two equilibria actually. So I give you both equilibria uh, at each point. And here you have the prediction from the monopoly case. Okay, and so what you can see is that in general, uh, the, the behavior of the algorithms is somewhere between the competitive case and the monopolistic case, okay? And so these are properties that are quite general and, and also happen with many uh, other values of alpha and beta that we, that we have tried, okay? And so importantly, we can generate predictions about all these variables in this, uh, in this environment. Let me show you what is perhaps the most striking result, I think. So we do some uh, comparative statics exercises, okay? So we, 
uh, we add our base, baseline uh, case and then we change you know one parameter uh, at a time and so here it's an experiment in which we change sigma so we change the standard deviation of the distribution of the private values okay so when sigma increases i showed you this in the theory before when sigma increases uh, there is basically you know more chances that you face a high demand even <clears throat> when the value of the asset is low so this tends to reduce adverse selection and what you can see is that if you look at the the blue line so the blue line that's the outcome of a duopoly of algorithms okay you can see that the price that you obtain is actually increasing in sigma okay and the nash equilibrium prediction would be the opposite so the nash equilibrium prediction if you remember was that as you increase sigma there is less and less adverse selection so competitive market makers are able to quote lower and lower prices okay the algorithms it's not what they do actually they quote prices that are higher when sigma uh, increases if you look at the monopolist okay the theory in the monopoly case would predict this okay in the monopoly case because when you have a higher sigma you also have a, a lower demand elasticity the monopoly case predicts that actually the price will be increasing in sigma okay so in terms of comparative statics it seems that actually our algorithms they behave more uh, like a monopolist than like a duopolist you know relative to the to the theory okay so that's the comparative statics with respect to um, to sigma you can do comparative statics with respect to delta v so you know the difference in valuation between the high value uh, vh and the low value uh, vl so here what you observe is that the duopoly uh, is sorry the yes exactly duopoly algorithm is somewhere between the uh, competitive outcome which is the green line and the monopolistic uh, outcome which is uh, the black line okay it's kind of in the middle so there is nothing weird in, in terms of direction but clearly you are not that close to uh, to the Nash equilibrium uh, prediction you can do comparative statics on the number of market makers i'm sorry this graph is a little bit uh, difficult to uh, to read but you can just focus on the red line and the green line okay so the green line would predict that basically as you move from one market maker to two market makers you decrease the price a lot and then it doesn't depend on how many market makers you have okay what we see with algorithms is that actually the price decreases more or less linearly actually in the number of market makers and again this echoes these ideas in uh, in the paper by, by brogard and garriott that you know it looks a bit more like uh, quantity competition than price competition and basically you need a lot of market makers to reach uh, Nash equilibrium prices here we have 10 different algorithms that compete with each other and they, and they don't reach uh, the Nash equilibrium price at all they are still quite far from it actually okay so if, if you continue like this probably you would need something like 20 um, market makers if I um, extrapolate a little bit okay so we we, we see this kind of non-competitive behavior uh, coming back to Rose's uh, question we can look at what happens when you change the tick size so surprisingly for us, uh, not much happens actually. So you know it's quite flat in terms of uh, in terms of the tick. We think that the reason for that is that when you have a lower tick size, it, it favors undercutting. But at the same time, you know your Q matrix becomes bigger, and so learning becomes slower. Okay, and so it seems that at least in the experiments we have done, these two effects kind of compensate each other, and so not much happens. So the prices don't really depend on the tick size this might not be a general result it, it probably depends on the way we, we parameterize on this okay all right um i'm more or less done for the main part so i'm happy to take some questions now and if i have five minutes i can also talk about an extension with price discovery but if there are some questions maybe it's a good idea to take them now okay yeah there's there's been a, a pretty vigorous debate in here um oh wow well, okay i haven't seen uh, uh, let's see we're talking about um I don't know. I think it, it, a lot of the responses kind of been to, to a comment that Pete posted. Do you want to do you want to mention that, or do, are you um, enjoying the discussion? Enjoying the discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so okay, then let's let's defer that one to a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure which one of these to pick out if people want to mention. I know Pete Pete had a Peter had a question. Um, I'm not sure if that's been in the chat. Um, I don't know, but if there's a, if there's nobody who wants to like ask stuff right now, then we can go on to your to your to like a additional result you wanted to present. Okay. 
Okay, I can, so I just go on and we, we see afterwards? No, uh, Andreas is a question. Oh, yeah, we got a hand. Andreas, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was wondering um, how these results change if you allow for heterogeneity in those um, alpha and beta parameters for the Q learning. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically, if you think in terms of market composition, uh, suppose you compared prof you got heterogeneity across, across um, firms and looked at the, um, profits over time. Uh, you know, that would be sort of, uh, you know, what, what would be a successful parameters in that sense? Right. Okay. That's interesting. So we, we have done a little bit of this. So what we had done at some point was uh, to try to find a kind of Nash equilibrium in alpha and beta. So the idea is that, you know, you, you choose your alpha and beta, uh, your opponent chooses alpha and beta, then we run the algorithm, we compute the profit, and then we see if you have an incentive to uh, pick another alpha and beta. And so this implies, you know, looking at cases in which the, the alpha and beta are potentially uh, asymmetric. Um, so from what I remember, qualitatively, it's, it's not that different, uh, but what will happen, of course, is that the outcome, uh, the outcome will, will change. So the final price will change. What cannot happen, for instance, or, or very rarely, is that, uh, for instance, one algorithm would uh, would be inactive. So because you know at the end of the day, you are still going to learn to play the same price as your opponent at least. So uh, you will see that both algorithms are active in the long run. and um, but the level at which the price that they both select is going to depend uh, on whether they are symmetric or not basically. Okay, thanks. Uh, Albert, or I mean, I, I, I don't know. I let you in. Yeah, uh, Albert's, Albert's hand is first, so why don't we, why don't we take Albert? Uh, yeah, this is great. This is great stuff. Um, I, I'm just still trying to get my head around it, but I, I like where this is going. Um, have you? Um, uh, because I know for a fact, for one, for one firm that uh, that I've been uh, seen operate, um, they they certainly have some sort of trial and error. Uh, in the way they interact with the markets. Um, of course, now it's also interesting to think about if you have multiple um, um, uh, uh, Q-learning algorithms start, and if there is an exit, now at some point, the you know, one of them might drop because whatever uh, price they uh, consider, they seem to, to, to get a negative outcome, and so they might leave. So, and then you would have an additional interesting parameter, which is how many uh, algorithms would be there in the long run. Have you considered that? Okay, no, not yet. So for the moment, as you can see, we have a pretty simple um, environment. What I like in this idea is that, you know, if firms might leave either exogenously or endogenously over time, this also means that, you know, it makes sense to use this, this alpha, which is constant, because, you know, you don't want to put too much weight on the past, because maybe in the distant past, the number of firms was different. And so playing the optimum of that distant past is no longer uh, optimal, uh, but I agree. No, it's something we can consider. Maybe one possibility would be to consider kind of you know, exo kind of you know, exogenous shocks that you know we, you you just remove one algorithm and you see what happens and you try to draw some kind of impulse response functions, so to speak. Um, th this is a good suggestion. We just need to, to see you know what happens in that case. That's what Thank I'm you. Um, uh, so Mina, why don't you go go ahead? Hey, uh, you know, I like it a lot. It's very new, I mean, new to me. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to learn more, learning more about it. Uh, so I just have just uh, some reaction. So first, like, is this about uh, the difference between human trading and algorithmic trading or kind of different types of learning? It seems like it's more about, you know, kind of a Bayesian learning, the standard traditional framework where we assume a lot of structure versus kind of more realistic uh, learning. And uh, uh, so kind of that's just the one uh, comment. But then I think, I mean, so what, what you're doing, I think it makes a lot of sense like that, you know, we don't know how many traders there are. We don't know the distribution of all these things. So it uh, really it must be really hard for real world traders or algorithm to learn. But then you kind of open the can of worm in some sense, right? Uh, right. You talked about how these alpha and beta are not chosen optimally and 
you know, I, it makes me, it reminds me of this kind of RHGART model, you know, that you want to estimate volatilities that are time varying and data might be moving around and you want somehow want to impose some simple rule. And, you know, sometimes they actually work very well and we kind of uh, use RHGART a lot. So mm -hmm. I think that also kind of uh, was, a, I mean, it's just some uh, thought that I had. But then because of opening all the can of worms, it kind of, it's kind of hard to interpret these uh, results from simulations uh, as reflecting the real world necessarily. And also you talked about how kind of constant alpha makes sense because the data might be changing. But then I think in this simulation, you are not changing the V. So, uh, you know, that seems like, something that you might want to play around and, you know, all these other factors about like symmetry of strategies or kind of, I mean, I think the biggest, I think the kind of at least theoretically what's interesting to me is the strategic aspect of the other side, right? The other mm -hmm. side is just doing very simple thing. But then if I understand that algorithm is algorithm or the you know, algorithm is doing this dynamic thing. What is my optimal strategy, and how should they respond? But, but, but these are just the kind of thoughts because I was kind of excited and interested in. I think uh, I, I, uh, I just liked it a lot. Thank you, Mina. Thanks a lot. So, uh, okay, it's a very rich comment. So I, I wrote down everything. So let me just say, you know, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, in particular, as I said, you know, it's work in progress, a bit like my haircut and my beard. And so we have not played around with the model as much as, as we will do in the future. Uh, and so you, you will, hopefully you will see some new results in, in further updates. Um, the most interesting comment probably, I mean, really, I think you touched upon something very fundamental, which is, okay, is it really about human versus algorithms or is it about different forms of learning, okay? And I think that's a pretty deep question because actually uh, these algorithms originally they were meant to model uh, humans actually you know it was a, a way to model the way humans learn and, and there's a whole literature of course in game theory trying to model to find like you know basic rules uh, for the learning of humans and the question is do you converge to Bayesian learning or not and, and so that's not necessarily clear that's why actually and so two things on this so so one is I think what would be very interesting would be to know uh, how humans behave in the same game, like having you know an experiment with humans to see do they reach a different outcome because maybe actually we reach something that the, the same problems that humans would have. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but you know it would be good to have, to have confirmation of this. Um, and uh, and sorry, I had a second point. Uh, I had a second point on this. Yeah, and second is about is about the theory that we try to. Uh, I agree, it's different. It's difficult to interpret simulation results. You know, as a theorist, I can only sympathize with that. Uh, and so we are busy right now trying to find, you know, maybe at least under some more starker assumptions about the way the algorithms behave, a way to have some more analytical prediction to better understand uh, how this happens. I think we have played so much with them that we kind of understand the intuition behind this behavior, but uh, having some equations would make it much clearer. Thanks again. Okay. Um, I think we have uh, Josh Molnar's hand is up next. Would you like to go ahead, Josh? Sure, yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. Very interesting stuff. Uh, and I guess just one question. So, you know, you probably know this stuff better than I do, but as I understand it, the computer scientists, they have some algorithms that guarantee you these, um, you know, no asymptotic regret like a property that, that some algorithms have. And I just wanted to see if I, if I understand uh, correctly that the first result that you showed us that with a monopolist algorithm, you don't necessarily converge to the optimal monopoly price. Does, does that mean that Q-learning does not have this no asymptotic hmm. regret property? And, th and then I guess that feeds into maybe a, a broader point, which is why Q-learning as opposed to you know, any of the other algorithms that, that are out there. Okay, uh, very good. So the, so the asymptotic properties of Q-learning algorithms, so here it's kind of interesting because when you look at the CS literature, it's a bit uh, confusing. So many papers, they mention that there are well-known asymptotic properties of these algorithms that they converge da, 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 under some assumptions, but nobody ever mentions the assumptions. If you look at the actual papers with the actual proofs, the assumptions make it almost trivial. So the assumptions is that 
are that you experiment forever. So the, the epsilon cannot decay uh, to zero and, uh, and you don't forget about the past, okay? And so in that case, well, basically the central limit CRM uh, applies. And so you are going to play everything an infinite number of times. You are going to compute the average. The average is going to compute to the actual payoff and you are going to play optimally. Uh, so for the monopoly that would work, you would find the monopoly price. For the duopoly that would not work, actually, you don't necessarily converge uh, to the Nash equilibrium, even in that case. But then in practice, it's not at all what people use because in applications, you don't want to experiment forever and you don't want to, uh, to give too much weight on, on, on past experiments that are too distant. And so in practice, people are using algorithms that actually don't converge, and in particular, don't converge uh, to the truth. Okay, So that's, that's a bit uh, puzzling. When the paper is out, you will see the, the proper references to the, the papers with the proofs. But it took us, this confused us for a very, for a very long time, basically. OK. Um, I don't see other hands, but I had a question, which is basically one of the things that I was kind of struck by was the symmetry of the, you know, the resultant, you know, algorithms, right? I found that to be kind of like a little odd, but I suspect that's maybe like a function of the fact that there's like a symmetric valuation liquidity distribution. I'd like be in, kind of interested to see if you use like a, like a log normal or something with like kind of fatter tails or you know, mm. just, just kind of a weirder shape. If you end up with get like some kind of like specialization where like some algo just kind of handles like baseline average demand and then some other algorithm is like, okay, I only handle the tails. I only bit, mm. bit into the tails. I think that would be kind of interesting to see their specialization. Okay. I don't know if you guys have tinkered with that yet. No, that, that's quite interesting. So actually we, so I don't show you everything we have here. So we have also computed, you know, like the Airfidal index and so on to see whether they split the market or not. Um, so here the thing, so, okay. So in the extension that I'm not going to show, uh, there are multiple periods and there there are multiple states. And so you can have specializations in the sense that some algorithms can be uh, more competitive in some states and others in other states. Uh, that part is still you know, even, more, uh, even more work in progress, but these kind of things can happen, I think even without introducing uh, uh, fat tails um, and so on. Okay. Yeah, but that's these are of course interesting things to explore. I mean, all this is okay. music to my ears. I think our point here is, look, you know, if even in this very simple thing, you already generate behavior that is kind of interesting, and so probably it's worth you know considering this type of of models and adding you know more realistic features and see what happens and so on. So totally. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, um, I think uh, we're completely out of time. So. Oh. Oh yeah. We're we're at the we're at the top of the hour. So we're okay. we're like into. Yeah, can I take can, like... one minute to, to conclude? Or, and oh, and then sure, if there are other questions, I'm super happy to take them on this. Yeah. But, okay. All right. So we have an extension with price discovery where basically we play the, the, the Gloucester Milgram game with several periods. And then we can study whether there is price discovery, uh, whether people learn to update after seeing a strong demand and so on. And so uh, I'm not going to talk about this because I, I don't have time, but basically dealers are still able to learn in this environment, but again, there are some results that are quite different from the theory and that are um, interesting, okay? But I, I'm, I'm out of time, so let me skip that. And so just to conclude, so as I said, the way we think about this project, and I, I don't want us to be misunderstood on this, so it's really a first step, and we think, you know, this calls for more research on this front, and so if other people, you know, want to work on this, we think it's a, it's a great idea. So far, we make uh, three points. So the first one is that algorithms matter. We get an outcome which is different from standard theory. Okay. Another interpretation is that standard theory is not very good, maybe, and so, you know, uh, Mina suggested maybe something more along this line. Um, the second point is that adverse selection matters. Okay, so in this setup with adverse selection, we obtain results that are <coughs> quite different from what happens in the existing IO literature where there is no uh, adverse selection. And finally, even with a relatively large number of algorithms, this does not guarantee uh, competitive behavior. So the next steps in this research program that you know, uh, we will take part of them, so there's a lot of space for others, I think, is to introduce more realistic algorithms. Okay, So we, we try to prove this concept with very simple things, but of course, algorithms in reality are more complicated than this, uh, to examine richer economic environments in which more things uh, can happen, and to try to get at predictions that are closer to the data and that can be really uh, tested empirically. We have predictions you know, on, on spreads, volumes, uh, price impacts, and so on, 
that can be taken to the data, but you know, we are aware that this is a very simplistic model. So you know, maybe this explains something, but uh, who knows? Okay, and so we will probably you know, there's space for more more applied papers on this. All right, so thank you very much. I'm happy to stay around for any question you have, but thanks a lot for all the questions already. Okay, so this will be like the, the formal end of the talk, So, but we're gonna keep, keep going. So um, thank you guys, everyone for coming along. And if you have to go, you know, it's been wonderful having you and I hope to see you guys next season. Okay, um, ton of hands shooting up. I think I saw Andreas Utman, you had your, your hand up first. Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I, I was just wondering, um, I mean, we might have talked about this if you had gotten into the price discovery part. Um, how do you think of um, these firms knowing the value kind of at the end, so the retail in order to sort of get feedback on the profits? I mean, I guess in normal markets, you wouldn't. Um, is there something you could relax by basically just looking at sort of profits from trades in the opposite direction or, you know, just, just your thoughts on this? Okay, super interesting question. So, um, so indeed, that, so when you have multiple periods, that becomes tricky. So, in the extension with several periods, what we do is that, you know, you trade in the first period, you record how much, pro, you know, the the price that you that you were paid, and your inventory. Okay. Second period, you trade again, you record the price, the inventory, and only now we reveal what is the value v tilde and how much you should value your inventory. Okay, you could have this with 100 periods. You would keep track of your inventory all the time and value your inventory at the end. You could even do uh, things closer to, to Stefano's uh, previous research and say, you know, you never know. Basically, it's Vitilda. You just keep track of your inventory, and, and so you, this would require to have uh, buys and sells. I think we think this is an interesting alternative way of modeling this, but it's a bit further from you know standard uh, the standard setup. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Pete, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, related to a comment that I made. If you, if you have a, a duopoly model and one of the players has an alpha that's very, very close to zero, mm -hmm. and the other player has an alpha that's not that close to zero, you're going to say it's uh, pretty big. It would seem to me that it would evolve to a Stackelberg leader equilibrium because having an alpha very, very close to zero is, is like a, a commitment device that says, I'm going to play the strategy I've been playing. <laughs> which is mm -hmm. sort of optimal against whatever it is you're doing. But what you're doing is changing very quickly to be optimal against what I'm doing. That sounds to me like a Stackelberg leader. And, and, I, and I know in a, uh, if you just do a repeated Cournot duopoly with quadratic adjustment costs, if one, one player has really, really high costs and the other player has really, really low costs, you might think, uh, okay, he's not very flexible, but in fact, he's pretty committing to be a Stackelberg leader. Because, um, and the equilibrium becomes like a Stackelberg leader model. I, I'm just wondering if in these reinforcement uh, learning models, that's what you get. Um, and if so, uh, it, it even suggests that in the, um, in, in the equilibrium where the alphas are the same, you know, you'll get different, different equilibria, of course, for different alphas. Um, and it does raise the question of whether our theoretical models of Bayesian Nash equilibrium are right. You know, mm -hmm. what, is the, uh, what is the right way to think about what happens in the world? Is it... Um, uh, is it the way you introduced your talk, or is it um, is it that that people learn, but the way in which they learn is a pre the speed with which they learn is like a pre commitment device that changes the game, so the equilibrium is different. Um, anyway, I uh, I think that this type of research um, is uh, really important uh, for market microstructure uh, going forward. And so uh, you know, thank you for. Uh, uh, the other paper. Thanks a lot, Pete. For it's a, it's, it's a super. So thanks a lot for this comment. It's it's very uh, it's very interesting. The, um, um, okay. So so I, I I see your point about the 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 link with Stackelberg. Off the top of my head, I don't remember the results with asymmetric alphas well enough to to really confirm that this is what happens. But uh, I'll come back to those results with with this point in mind to see if that's. Uh, if that's the case, because I find this really interesting. So basically, you know, what we tried so far is just two benchmarks, which is just, you know, a pure Bertrand or monopoly. Uh, maybe actually under some conditions, we reach something closer to, to another benchmark, which may be a better theory for what happens here. And so that's then something we need to, to think about uh, more. So, so very, very useful. Thank you. 
Uh, Vincent, uh, I see your hand. Do you want to go? Go ahead. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. So, um, uh, very nice paper. I was wondering uh, whether you did consider, um, given different market makers, different search models, and then run some sort of a horse race between them to see uh, who wins, who, who gets mm -hmm. the most profit eventually. And this may uh, help you guide which algorithm to eventually focus on in the paper, given that there are so many potential candidates. Uh, that's very interesting too. So for the moment, we have we have not done that um, too much. By the way, I should have mentioned this before, but I think in the chat at some point we had uh, Amin, who has been our fantastic research assistant on this uh, on this. So if you're interested in hiring, you know, a great person for a PhD program or something, think of Amin. Uh, and he has played a little bit with different. Uh, with different families of algorithms as well, but we have not systematically explored, you know, a competition between two families and these kind of things. Uh, that's quite interesting. I think so. My my understanding of what happens there is that you know, if you have an algorithm that is designed to uh, to explore more at the beginning, what that's going to generate is that at the beginning you are going to play higher prices on average. And so that's going to kind of teach your opponent to also play high prices, and that's going to lead to supra competitive prices uh, in the long run. Okay. And so actually, you could have a kind of strange incentive to have an algorithm that is very, very slow at learning because that's going to make your, your opponent softer. And in the long run, you are going to generate more profit. But if you really enter this kind of, of reasoning, you can you can do even much better than this actually if i know that my opponent is using a q learning algorithm i can really manipulate my opponent totally i can teach my opponent to play any price i want basically right which could be for instance the monopoly price i could teach my opponent to play the monopoly price forever and then i'm going to play the monopoly price forever and we are going to share uh, the monopoly profits okay so there are many interesting questions like this that you can ask you know as soon as you relax the assumption of, of symmetry between the, the algorithms so i totally agree yeah. uh okay i see no hands does anybody have any uh final questions all right lots of head shakes okay uh i think we can wrap up then for today um i hope everyone enjoys their day if you're if you're uh Wake it up in my time zone or enjoys your evening if you're in Europe or wherever. Um, so it's been lovely to see everyone and uh, please thank Jean Edouard for us. Um, yeah. Thank you, Have everyone. That was absolutely uh, fantastic. I mean, it's a preliminary version. So having all this feedback is just incre so incredibly useful. I can't thank you enough. Yeah. So looking I love forward that. That to was a good one. meeting again everybody in person this week. It'll be excellent. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.